All right. Welcome, everybody, to session four in this uh, Stoic Sundays series, which we've been doing now for about a month and a half, concentrating on the cardinal virtues. We did one uh, session specifically about all of the virtues and what they encompass, and then we've been concentrating on each of the four in turn. So this time, having looked at wisdom and justice already, we're going to be looking at another virtue that for some people gets confused with like stoicism as such, and that is the virtue of courage, uh, which is a very important one within Stoic philosophy, but in some respects, not the most important, right? If we look at what the actual Stoics have to say, there's kind of a priority to wisdom and justice. That's why we looked at them first. But courage plays a really important role. And we're going to talk about the scope of courage, which is a lot wider than a lot of other people make it out to be. Before we get started, um, I do want to say that, you know, one reason for doing these deep dives into virtues is to, to help people not fall into traps that are out there. You know, stoicism has become very popular. There's a lot of people who glommed onto it without a lot of uh, serious study or practice of stoic texts. They're bad guides. They're, they mislead you about what stoicism is. And we've actually got a term in the whole modern stoic movement for people who do it with respect primarily to courage and tied in with traditional gender roles and stuff like that. We call it broicism, right? From bro, bros, or, you know, all these, these guys who are, you know, pretty afraid of women uh, and, and, you know, need to like show what tough guys they are all the time. That's not stoicism. And that's not even really courage, as we're going to see, as uh, the Stoics understand it. You know, this is how Stoicism gets um, reduced or, or transmuted into silliness about like repressing emotions and taking cold showers and how much you bench, bro. And But also, you can say, without people who are, you know, like into that sort of thing, uh, you know, fearlessly telling the truth. Well, you know, because I think many of you remember that case of the guy who tried to claim stoicism as the reason why he was making disparaging and racist remarks to his Asian co-workers and then went before a British judge. If you don't know about that case, we can talk about that a little bit later on. It's, it, it, but he claimed that being stoic meant, you know, standing up and saying what you think. No, not really the case. Uh, and that's not courage either. Um, I do also want to say something about terminology and uh, the text that we're going to be using and, and referencing. So in Greek, Andrea is the, the term that is translated as courage, or we'll talk about other English possible translations as well. And it is indeed the word uh, it's coming from, the word for uh, male or man, aner, right? But by the time that the Stoics are, you know, um, major on the scene, even I would say a little bit before them, it's kind of losing that that single gender status, right? Because Plato is telling us already in the Republic that women can display Andrea. And certainly Epictetus's teacher, Musonius Rufus, is saying men and women can both display Andrea courage to the same extent. In Latin, the term is going to be fortitudo, right? Which we, you know, easily turn into the English cognate. And so we should talk about English terms. Fortitude, courage, bravery. These are these are common ways in English of translating the, these Greek or Latin terms. And as we're going to see, bravery isn't quite enough. Courage in, in the way that we usually talk about it isn't quite enough to translate it completely. But, you know, it's, it's the best we're going to get in English. And if we want to understand Stoicism, we cannot afford to not go to the primary text, to the classic texts, 
And as I've said at the start of all of these, I'm going to give you a little rundown about, you know, who we can read and uh, who you can go to. You can easily find almost all of these online uh, available to you for free. There's a, a very selected few that you, you can't and you'd have to order them. So, you know, what do we have? We have the late Roman thinkers, Seneca, Epictetus, supplemented by, you know, uh, Musonius Rufus, Marcus Aurelius, Heracles. All of these are, you know, what we call late Stoic authors. And then we have these really two important summaries of Stoic doctrine, Diogenes Laertes and Arius Didymus. And then another <clears throat> really invaluable source that we want to, to use is Marcus Tullius Cicero, who himself was not a Stoic, but <clears throat> was very sympathetic to the Stoics, right? In Tusculan Disputations, if you read through those, I forget whether it's in book three or book four, uh, he says, if I was not a, an academic, I would be a Stoic. So, you know, he, he really incorporates a lot and he transmits a lot to us. But where should we start? Let's think about something that I brought up in previous sessions, this famous passage by Seneca in letter 120 that gives kind of a summary of what the virtues are about. He says, the desires had to be reined in, fear to be suppressed, proper actions to be arranged, debts to be paid. Therefore, we included temperance or self-restraint, bravery, courage, prudence, and justice, assigning to each quality its special function. Now, Seneca knows that courage is way, way wider in scope than just reigning in fear, but that is something that we typically associate with courage, isn't it? And that's the, you might say, default starting point in our contemporary culture and also in a lot of ancient virtue ethics. You're going to find that Aristotle really frames courage as primarily being about dealing with fear and confidence um, and, and doing so, you know, he, he thinks the paradigm is the soldier on the battlefield. The Stoics are going to extend it much further. So there's several key aspects that I want to highlight or bullet point at the beginning about what Stoics take courage to, to consist in, to include. One of these is, you know, this aspect of bravery, which is not just framed in terms of like, resisting fear, but understanding, having knowledge about what really is worth fearing, what, what is genuinely fearful. Then there's also this aspect of courage as including endurance, including uh, what's later on going to be patience, right? Already in the Stoics, that, that um, sub-virtue is, is quite important. But it's not just passive. It's there, there's a let's keep moving aspect to it. Perseverance would be another way of thinking about it. So now we've got two important aspects of courage. Another that's absolutely central to Stoic writings on this magnanimity or great solidness, being able to rise above all the silly BS and even the important BS and to, you know, to, to have a, what they call a lofty spirit or a lofty mind. And then the fourth, dealing with emotions, but not just fear or not just fear plus confidence, thares in, in Greek, but other emotions as well. This is something really quite interesting about the Stoics. They think that courage has to do with a wide range of emotions and how we how we handle them. So Cicero, um, you know, sort of echoing Seneca, tells us there's four virtues from which all moral rectitude and moral duty flow. And, you know, he tells us that all is all that's morally right arises from one of four sources. The four the, the source that we're really interested in here is what he calls the greatness and strength of a noble spirit, the magnanimity side of it that's connected with courage. In uh, letter 85, Seneca discusses courage, and he points out that the person who has and exercises courage, in many cases, won't feel fear. Why not? 
because they have knowledge about what is, you know, genuinely something we should be afraid of or concerned with or worried about or anxious about. And in many cases, you know, we find out we're not supposed to be, or it doesn't make sense to be worried about those sorts of things. The person who is courageous knows that what appears to be dangerous or harmful to many other people, and perhaps even to a previous version of their self, isn't actually so. And Seneca, um, you know, expands this by saying, um, courage is neither rash bravado, nor thrill-seeking, nor love of danger. Rather, it's a knowledge about how to distinguish between what is bad and what is not. Courage is very careful of its own safety, but it's also very well able to endure things whose bad appearance is false. Cicero in On Duties, book one, in his long discussion of courage, tells us we must never be guilty of seeming cowardly and craven, in the Latin term there, imbelles and timidique, right, in the face of danger, but we also must beware of exposing ourselves to danger needlessly. Nothing can be more foolhardy than that. So, you know, if you know your Aristotle, you know that courage is one of the paradigm virtues for him. And he talks about the, the cowardly person who gives in to fear. But at the other extreme, there's the rash or foolhardy person who either doesn't feel fear when they should feel fear or who jumps into things uh, kind of silly, uh, you know, imprudently. Uh, very often, as Aristotle points out, they're actually motivated by fear, the fear of looking scared, you know. And we can think of all sorts of contemporary applications of this. You know, I'll, I'll just point one out. When you hear in American uh, policing the endless line in court cases, I was in fear of my life, and that's why I shot this guy full of holes, that's actually cowardliness, right? And, and it's it's a kind of a rashness that's cowardliness. But we can talk about that more later on. The point is, just as for Aristotelians, for Stoics, courage is a kind of, without them calling it this, middle position. But it's one that's motivated just as it was for Plato, as we saw, like, for example, in the Phaedo, where Socrates talks about philosophical courage and other people's not really courage, it's, it's involving a kind of knowledge, uh, knowing what's actually good for us, what's actually bad for us, and what only appears so. Now, in all of these sessions, one of the things that we've been doing is breaking uh, things down along the way that the Stoics have and then kind of putting them together in a composite picture. And one of the great sources for this is Diogenes Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers. Uh, those of you who have been here before have heard me mention this many, many times. Diogenes is not himself a Stoic. He is somebody who you know, writes a history of philosophy, but he provides us with a summary of Stoic doctrine in Book 7 in his Life of Zeno. And he tells us that, you know, the kalon, what, what is valuable uh, and beautiful in itself, has four types, is similar to what, you know, Cicero and Seneca were saying. And what is courageous, andreion in Greek, is part of that. And, you know, if a person has virtue, they can both figure out and do what they ought to do. Here, actually, he uses the term theoretike, practike, and poetike. Um, and the things that ought to be done include what ought to be endured, hupo menetea. It also includes what should be chosen, what should be, um, uh, you know, distributed, things like that. But we, we want to think about um, what ought to be endured, what ought to be worked through, you could say, is another way of translating it. A little bit earlier in in uh, uh, book nine or book seven, he talks about courage as being knowledge, episteme in Greek, of what we ought to choose, hereton in Greek, and what we ought to be cautious of, eulabeon in Greek. Now I'm going to come back to that term in another uh, minute because it's really important. But the third thing is what is neither. 
udeteron, the, the neutral thing, right? So we've got what ought to be chosen, what ought to be exercised caution, or, you know, we should look at it suspiciously, or however you want to put it, and then what's in the middle, the things that aren't either of these. Courage, if you want to have re real courage, you need to have, the, you know, a knowledge of those things. Now, why did I bring up Eula Bayon? Well, because that is going to turn out to be one of the Stoic good emotions. Um, the Stoics say that you, you know, most fears are actually groundless. But you can fear rationally. I mean, there are some things that you ought to be worried about, including your own character and whether you're going to measure up or not. With those things, we can exercise caution or ulabea in, in Greek. The Stoics think that that's something very important. Um, there's two other sub-virtues that in that passage Diogenes Laertes talks about. There's magnanimity, which you've heard me mention now uh, several times already, megalos psuchia, which is also a knowledge, but he, here he says it's a knowledge or a disposition, a hexis, which makes one superior to anything that happens, whether good or bad is the translation in the English uh, uh, translation of Diogenes Laertes. But it's actually better to call it you know, things that are worth paying attention to and the things that are trivial, phalon uh, kai spudion in Greek. So that's one aspect, right? And then there's endurance, karteria in Greek, knowledge or habit which suggests what we are to hold fast to. Again, we have this uh, word emeneteon, um, what we're supposed to remain in, what isn't, what we're not supposed to worry about and hold fast to, and what is neither. So you see that there's a, 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 you know, courage is not just a feeling for the Stoics. There's a, a whole set of cognitive components, not just to courage itself, but also to its sub-virtues. Diogenes will also talk about two other things. He breaks courage down into constancy. Um, there's an English translation for it. Apolaraxia and vigor, eutonia, which is kind of an interesting term, uh, given that the, the Stoics use this term tonos uh, to talk about like the, to we, we call it the tone or the tenor of uh, substances and things and stuff like that. And so um, these are some important ways of breaking courage down <coughs> into its sub-virtues. Arius Didymus, who wrote an epitome of Stoic ethics, very easy to get your hands on, right? Um, broke it down to five different subcategories, which overlap to some degree with what Diogenes Laertes is telling us. He talks about um, perseverance. It's translated there, carteria, the same thing that we just called endurance, right? Is knowledge ready to persist in, and we see that same term, um, emenicaten, what, what has been correctly decided. So once you've actually figured out what you ought to stick with, what you ought to hold to, what you ought to resist to, um, resist against rather, then you have to have perseverance or you have to have endurance. This is something that you do over and over and over again, right? You don't just say, well, I'm persevere and you've made your decision up once and for all. You have to keep on making that decision. Then he talks about something that fits in with the, you know, the more like having confidence part, intrepidness is how they're translating it. Thoroleotes, um, a great way of translating this would be bravery, I think, too. Knowledge through which we know we shall not encounter anything truly terrible, udeni denoi in, in Greek. The, the things that we think are, are scary turn out not to be uh, all that scary. It's knowledge through which we know we can handle things, right? That's what uh, confidence or bravery turns out to be. Then we see once again, uh, great heartedness is how it's being translated. Magnanimity, megalopsuchia in Greek, is a knowledge that acts. 
and he uses the, the term for doing things there, above what occurs naturally in both worthwhile and worthless or trivial matters. Once again, we see those terms of spudaios and phalois being used. So that's uh, also quite, quite important as well. Um, Stout-heartedness, eupsuchia, literally like having a good soul. You know, that's that's kind of a cool term. Knowledge belonging to a soul as it shows itself, invincible or unconquerable. Acheton, um, literally unable to be mastered or, or conquered. It shows itself as such because it knows itself as such. And then finally, now this is a really, really important aspect of it. I tell my students that you can display courage by actually doing your study and doing your homework and, you know, resisting the temptation to say, ah, I've done enough. Let's let, and to tell yourself, let's keep on going with this. Philoponia. If you know um, your, your ancient Greek at all, Ponos means toil, trouble, pain, right? It means like the things that you don't want to do. Like, you know, for me as a, as a professor, the thing I dislike the most about um, teaching is grading, right? And I have to make myself do it. Well, that's a task. That is a work, a labor that I'm doing. So philoponia is translated as industriousness, knowledge about what... It, uh, knowledge which is able to accomplish what is proposed without being prevented by the toil, diaponon in, in Greek. It's a, the, the ponos is dealt with, and this is very active. This is not just enduring it, right? This is doing it, doing what is difficult for us. Getting up and doing public speaking might involve um, intrepidness, the confidence part, you know, realizing that uh, it's not going to be the end of the world if you say something dumb or you stutter or anything like that. But it also might involve philoponia, industriousness, right? So these are some, we, we've already covered a wide range of stuff, right? You see, courage for the Stoics includes an awful lot. Um, Cicero adds something to this, saying that a soul that is courageous and great will exhibit two additional characteristics. One of these is an indifference or contempt, we can translate it, uh, despicientia in Latin towards external things or circumstances. And then the other thing is that the person will seek out occasions to do things that he says are not only great and in the highest degree useful, but also very arduous and fraught with danger to life and to many things that make worth living. So the person who's genuinely courageous, notice there's two sides of this. They will seek out, right? We say that, you know, they're the person when everybody's running away, they run towards it. Think about, you know, a firefighter or a, um, you know, paramedic or somebody like that. The, the building is, is collapsing. These are the people who go in and they're looking for, are there survivors that we need to get out right away, Right. But the other thing that's really important, he says, they do actions that are not only great and in the highest degree useful. So they're not doing stupid things just to make themselves look cool. They're not seeking out danger just to seek out danger. Again, that's foolishness or foolhardiness. Um, when it comes to the emotion matter, there's a, a few things that I want to point out. And again, here we... Go back to Cicero and the discussion of courage in On Duties, Book One. So Cicero says that courage is indeed about dealing with fear, but it's also about other emotions. One of the other emotions that he thinks is particularly problematic and needs the curb of courage is anger. He spends a lot of discussion on like not seeking revenge, uh, keeping things within proper bounds, you know, and this is where wisdom and justice come in. Um, courage can very quickly degenerate into something that's not courage, but actually opposed to it when wisdom and justice get left out. So um, there's that. And then he also tells us we need to deal with, and this requires courage, Excessive desire, cupiditas, in desire for, you know, say, um, having sex or uh, 
getting, you know, acquiring things or, you know, eating as much as we want. Courage has something to do with that. It's not just temperance. Courage plays a role. Excessive pleasure, voluptas. Uh, courage should, should help us to resist that. And interestingly, pain or grief, aigritudo in Latin, that's also something uh, that courage should bear upon. So Cicero very clearly thinks of courage as applying to quite a few of the emotions. Epictetus also tells us some really interesting stuff about this, and I highly advise you, if you haven't read Epictetus's Discourses, you know, that is probably, that's my favorite Stoic text, Epictetus's Discourses. And the, the two chapters that I'm going to talk about here are both in book two. One is book two, chapter two, and one is book two, chapter five. Book two, chapter two, is called On Confidence and Caution. Um, and it, it, the, the title is actually a little bit more interesting. It literally says that um, confidence Tharein, being confident, you know, feeling bravery or something like that, and um, being cautious, ula uh, beistai, it's a verb, are not in conflict with each other. They don't, they're, not, they're not in contradiction. Um, OBM says, I read that chapter last night. So, well, that's good because that, that it's very fresh in your mind. And it's, it's a great chapter. And it's something I think that anybody who's interested in Stoicism needs to you know, think about and, and probably remind themselves of. So he says there, caution seems to be in a manner contrary to confidence and contraries are in no way consistent. So there's a problem, right? That which seems to many to be a paradox in the matter under consideration, in my opinion, is of this kind. If we asserted that we ought to employ caution and confidence in the same things, then people would be right. You know, we would be inconsistent here. And that really would be a problem. But he says, it's not the case. We should employ both confidence and caution, sometimes in relation to the same thing, but in different aspects. So here's a good example. Death. Death is one of the scariest things around, right? Not just our own death, but the death of other people. Oh, what am I going to do if this person dies? And he says that we can have confidence or courage or bravery against death, but we can have caution, ulabea, which is a kind of fear, right? national fear, against our own fear of death. So you see how these things can be um, employed in, in similar ways. We should have caution when it comes to the stuff that we actually have control over. We, so we don't screw it up, right? We can be like, yeah, I don't know if I'm actually going to measure up. Um, I need to employ caution in that. We can have courage or confidence towards the things that are externals that we don't actually have control over. Isn't that an interesting way of thinking about things? In that other chapter, uh, which is the fifth chapter of the, of the second book, he talks about magnanimity. Um, Maga, it's and it's uh, not Magala Psuches, it's uh, Magala Phronesis, if I remember right, and care, Epimalea. Um, this is about this is that great chapter about um, the use of externals and playing the game. Socrates played the game, right? And um, he says it's difficult to mingle and, and to bring together these two things the carefulness of the, of the person who's affected by the matter and the firmness of him who has no regard for it. But it is not impossible. If it were, then happiness would be impossible. But it's not. So we have to figure out how to balance these two things. That's part of courage for the Stoics. Musonius Rufus um, has something really quite interesting to say, and this is where we're going to wrap up and I'll, I'll start taking some of these, these questions and comments. This is in lecture three, where he's talking about, should women be educated in philosophy? And Musonius says, Rufus is, yeah, of course they should, um, because they should, they need to be virtuous and are just as capable of being virtuous as men are. And, and so he says, as for courage, certainly it's to be expected that the educated woman 
meaning trained in, in, in philosophy, will be more courageous than the uneducated one and the one who studied philosophy than the one who is not. And she will not therefore submit to anything shameful because of fear of death or unwillingness to face hardship. And she will not be intimidated by anyone because he is of noble birth or powerful or wealthy. No, not even if he be the tyrant of her city. For in fact, she has schooled herself to be high-minded and to think of death as not an evil and life not as a good, and likewise not to shun hardship and never for a moment to seek ease and indolence. So it is such a woman is likely to be energetic, strong to endure pain, prepared to nourish her children at her own breast and to serve her husband with her own hands and willing to do things which one would consider no better than slaves work. Now, lest anyone think that he's you know, reaffirming traditional gender roles, uh, if you look at his uh, chapter on marriage, partners are supposed to be equal. They're, you know, the husband is also supposed to be serving the wife. They're supposed to be friends and companions with each other in virtue, which both of them equally need. In lecture six, he says, virtue is not simply theoretical knowledge, but it's practical application as well. And so, you know, you have to act, you have to train yourself to act according to principles. So a person who wants to become good, not only must become familiar with the precept conducive to virtue, but must be earnest and zealous in applying these principles. And then he says, how could we acquire courage if we had merely learned that the things which seem dreadful to the average person are not to be feared, but had no experience in these sorts of things, right? We have to be doing things as well as like learning things, right? It's not enough just to have quotes written down that you, you, you know, oh, good, you know, uh, the Stoics define courage this way. Okay, now I know what to do. You actually have to practice it, right? And so he goes on and he says, um, the philosopher's body should be well prepared for physical activity because the virtues make use of this as a necessary instrument for the affairs of life. There's two kinds of training, one which is appropriate for the soul alone, the other which is common to both soul and body. We use the training common to both when we discipline ourselves to cold, heat, thirst, hunger, meager rations, hard beds, avoidance of pleasures, and patience under suffering. By these things and others like them, the body is strengthened and becomes capable of enduring hardship, st sturdy and ready for any task. The soul is strengthened too because it is trained for, what does he say? Courage by patience under hardship and self-control by abstinence from pleasures. So this is, you know, uh, Musonius, pretty hardcore teacher, Epictetus's mentor for a while. Um, giving you an idea about what you know, what it takes to acquire courage. It's not something that we just have in us. You know that some people are courageous, other people's aren't. This is something that we require training in all the time. So you see that that for the Stoics, courage really covers an awful lot, and there's a lot of moving parts to it, so to speak. And they are, as some of you have pointed out, interconnected with each other. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that if you want to see a really great discussion of a role model as the courageous person, Seneca's letter number 95, towards the end, he explicitly says, the best example of this is Cato. And he, and he goes down a list of things that he thinks are so important um, in that. All right, so Mark is here. Um, uh, good to see you. Um, let's see what else we've got. Mark says, I like the word reckless. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we need to have words to describe the person who is not courageous, but is a <clears throat> sort of a facsimile of, of courage, right? And Seneca talks about this in, in some of his letters, you know, how people can appear to have a virtue, but they don't really have the virtue. We should always be careful in judging from like one situation and being like, oh, look at how brave that person is. Unless we actually can look at the pattern of their conduct, we don't know if they're really brave or not or whether they're being driven by, by other things. So Mark um, says, we should fear allowing ourselves to become vicious. Right. And that is, so going back to the Epictetus thing, that's something we should have caution towards. 
And we, sh we should also have aversion towards being vicious, right? It shouldn't just be like, if we find out that we're vicious, the reaction shouldn't be, eh, not a big deal, right? <laughs> that's, that's the thing we really should get worked up about. And Mark says, uh, sometimes virtuous practice requires courage to sustain. Courage is needed to resist its perversion. Now that's an interesting point there, isn't it? Um, yeah, you need some measure of courage in order to like build upon uh, and make your courage greater and to resist the things that would take that courage away from you. The Stoics don't quite frame it like that, but I think that's, that's quite correct, right? Mark goes on and says, it's part of the interconnectedness you've been noting. Justice requires courage to be upheld. Yeah. And in turn requires knowledge or wisdom. These, these virtues are interconnected with each other. They're not all the same, right? It, it would be a mistake to take on the position that some people do where like, you know, there's only virtue and, and all these sub virtues don't matter. We do want to get down to the nitty gritty about how these different, um, aspects do reinforce each other and feed into each other. Very important. Uh, Sen Quidim says something kind of similar. It's all connected. Like if you come from a bad place in life that was hard to get out of, but you know it would be easy to slip back into it, which makes you afraid. So you have to find the courage to persevere in doing the hard things to stay in a good place instead of letting yourself go the easy way. Very, yeah, very good uh, point right there. Anybody who's facing difficulties, whether it's, you know, like I mentioned public speaking, right? When you ask people, what is the, your biggest fear? Lots and lots of people will say public speaking. And, um, you know, you can understand it, right? I mean, I used to have this terrible recurring dream that I think some of you know about because I've mentioned it in other places. When I first started teaching, I would be going into this big lecture hall and it was like, you know, 10 minutes before class started and the students are filing in and, you know, like the go-getters are up towards the front and I get to the podium and it's like a 200 people lecture hall. And then I realize I have no idea what class I'm teaching or where we are in the class, you know, how far along in the semester. So I'm trying to kind of bullshit my way through and I'm, you know, saying general things, trying to get a read from the students about where we are. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, right? I'm afraid that they're going to find out that I'm a fraud, right? This is imposter syndrome, right? And uh, I, I go through an entire 50-minute class period, never saying anything of substance, just trying to figure out where we are, and the students won't give me anything helpful, right? Um, public speaking, right? And, and then there's other things, like, you know, if you have an addiction, that can be very, very scary. You, you realize that there's something you know, wrong with your motivational structure and you're, and you know that you can't just snap your finger and change everything. And you're afraid of like sliding back into things or if you're dealing with abuse, right? Uh, as particularly if you're stuck in relationships, what are they going to say next? Am I going to lose it and, you know, uh, attack them? Am I, am I going to, if I say something, are they going to attack me? These are all things that do in fact require that we take the imperfect courage that we have and try to do something with it. And, and we don't always succeed. You know, this is something else that's worth pointing out. Um, we often are going to fail and then we need courage to pick ourselves up out of the dirt and keep going. I mean, people feel, feel, people fear failure in part because um, there is this like, sense that if I fail, everything is lost, right? And perseverance is part of, you know, saying, no, everything isn't lost um, as I fear. I can still make something of this, right? Um, Sen says, acting virtuous as a Stoic in a non-Stoic world requires courage because doing the right thing to the Stoic virtues is considered wrong by the non-Stoics. Well, sometimes considered wrong, sometimes considered right. Um, it, it, you can't make a complete blanket statement about that. Um, I mean, but maybe they they think that doing the just thing is, is good because it's expedient, right? Uh, they don't have the right motivational structure or reason behind it. Um, and, and yeah, in many cases, doing what you ought to do 
from a Stoic perspective, and really from any virtue ethics perspective, from an Aristotelian perspective, from a Platonist perspective, even an Epicurean perspective, people are going to say, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. And that's because they, they themselves have got things wrong and they inhabit a culture that constantly gives us things that are wrong-headed. Um, you will never live in a Stoic world. Um, you know, it's interesting. I answered a Quora question a while back. Uh, you know, what what if everybody in the world were Stoics? And I think I started the answer by saying, never going to be anything you have to worry about. <laughs> you know? But if, if it were, um, you know, things, there'd be a lot more social harmony and stuff like that. But that is never going to happen. The best you can ever get are temporary communities in which people are pretty good, you know. Um, but there's always the risk of, of things breaking down, right? Michael says, why did the Stoics hold so different views regarding women practicing philosophy compared to the peripatetics? Antiquity in general wasn't the golden age of feminism. Yeah, I mean, the second part is right. The first part, it's not as if they have like absolutely radically different views or something like that. It's a, it's a matter of degrees. I mean, a lot of it has less to do with the philosophy and much more to do with the culture of the time. I mean, you can say a similar thing about the, I'm, I'm just reading, you know, Virginia Woolf's um, A Room with a View, and she's making similar uh, uh, points about um, poetry in the 18th century in, in England, right? So it's not as if this is just a ancient philosophy sort of thing. I mean, the Aristotle says some boneheaded things about women that if he were around today, he would take back. The contemporary Aristotelian tradition doesn't think anything remotely like that and is in large part led by women scholars like Martha Nussbaum, and uh, who's not actually you know, Aristotelian as such, but you know definitely important in there, and Amelie Rorty, and Gisela Stryker, and uh, Nancy Sherman, you know, uh, you know, we could go on and on and on, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, the Stoics are more enlightened when it comes to gender roles. Um, it kind of varies. Musonius Rufus, probably more so than Epictetus, who doesn't hesitate to call men effeminate and to insist that men should have beards and stuff like that, right? And, you know, we can look at that and we can say, well, just as with Aristotle, uh, this is kind of a quirky, silly thing that maybe we we set aside, right? And we we take uh, what we need from it. And that's, you know, that's one of the good things about modern Stoicism. Um, Mark says, Arendt actually outright argues courage is necessary to be a citizen and participate in the public sphere. Or polis, uh, would you say this correlates with what any of the Stoics say? Yeah, you need courage in order to fulfill your roles, some of which are probably going to be political. I mean, I mentioned... Um, Seneca in letter 95 is using Cato as a prime example of the courageous person. One of the things that Cato does that impresses Seneca is that um, he resists uh, for, you know, as long as he can, uh, the, the demands of both Caesar and Pompey before finally deciding to fight in the civil war against Caesar on the side of Pompey, right? Um, so yeah, you, you, you definitely need courage, particularly if you're living in ancient Rome, but also in our times, right. To stand up for what's right, um, against all the misinformation that's, that's out there to hold people to standards requires courage. It's very easy in contemporary politics to say, oh, you know, our guys are good and we're not going to criticize them. You know, one of the things that's missing a lot of times in contemporary politics Consistency and consistency requires courage. Um, you know, somebody else who highlights the need for courage as an absolutely central virtue, Alistair McIntyre, right? Um, there's three virtues in particular in after virtue that are necessary for maintaining institutions as anything good um, justice, courage, and truthfulness, you know? So, yeah. Uh, Drav, what are my views on Nietzsche's views on Stoicism? Um, I think they're kind of garbage. Um, it's funny, people always bring, oh, you know, uh, the, this wonderful passage in Beyond Good and Evil. Oh, you Stoics, you self-tyrannize, you've got nature wrong. And 
and you read it and you're like, Nietzsche, you just have a different conception of nature than, than the Stoics do. It's sort of like saying, I like apples, you like oranges. I, you know, therefore you're wrong. Um, and if you look a little bit deeper into Beyond Good and Evil, this is why it's important to actually read whole texts, right? Um, Nietzsche thinks that everybody does self-tyrannizing, not just the Stoics. It's, it's part of the uh, having a will that is a complex arrangement of a will to power, you know? Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into, I mean, who, who cares if Nietzsche criticizes the Stoics? Um, concerned with, is the criticism a, a good criticism, right? It's not, it's not automatically right because Nietzsche says it or anything. Um, Sen Quidem points out Seneca has his conflicting parts about women as well. Yeah, I mean, Seneca was probably less, um, we could say, less consistent when it came to gender and the possibility of virtue than Musonius Rufus is. Um, Zeno appears to have been pretty um, enlightened himself that way, but we don't have any of his texts, so you know we don't know what the the Stoic, you know, the Republic written by Zeno, the Politeia, actually was. We just have a few, um, uh, not even excerpts, but rather um, summaries of it, right? All right, Mark says, you began the talk noting broicism and how a notion of courage might be misappropriated to sustain toxic masculinity. Can you say more about how caution could be cultivated to combat that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, point. And then somewhat tied to that more on the relationship between courage and anger. Yeah, so two, two important things. Um, well, let's start with the first one, right? So um, broicism definitely, I mean, it, it, whether or not, some people are like, oh, I don't like the term toxic masculinity. It is appropriate. Everyone knows some a-holes who pretend to be men and are really brittle little wimps who just happen to have strong bodies and out of control uh, tempers and stuff like that, right? And who are often like, you know, uh, later on, some sympathetic people buy them out of their troubles. Um, and we also know like the gym bros who take too many steroids and go into roid rages and stuff like that. And we know the, the people who are bitter, miserable, um, you know, misogynists as well. And all that fit figures into that. They would love to think of themselves as courageous when they're not really courageous. And I mean, again, you don't have to be a stoic in order to identify this. The Aristotelian tradition is super clear on this in Aristotle and in later writers. Um, the Platonist tradition also talks about this, right? Even the Epicurean tradition is going to talk about this a little bit, mostly in, in the relation to, to anger, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how easily the egos of these broics are bruised, and then they feel like they have to retaliate to show what big tough guys they are. And you can tell they don't actually know anything about stoicism and they'll also project they'll you know if you criticize them they'll be like why are you getting angry with me bro and they would be like what a mind reader you must be so that you can actually like read in youtube comments uh the fact of my psychology amazing i mean you you, you should be a psychotherapist right and obviously it's 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 false um but there are a lot of these uh broics out there and um there's also a lot of people who aren't really, they're interested in like little bits and pieces of stoicism, little life hacks and, you know, um, little, little things that they can turn into images or tattoos or stuff. Cause they, they think that, um, you know, virtus means manliness and all that. And, you know, if you dig into their psyches or even just observe them for a while, you can tell there's something wrong, something deeply wrong in them. Um, and you don't have to, you know, what are your duties towards them? Uh, you don't have to, like, get them out of their thing. They got themselves into their thing. It's up to them to get themselves out. But um, you can certainly tell them that they've got things wrong and, and, you know, maybe move on from there. Now, the anger thing. So the Stoics think that anger is always bad, right, as an emotion. They're famously opposed to the Aristotelians who say that, no, sometimes anger can actually serve a good purpose. What often gets left out, 
uh, the Platonists too. I mean, think about Republic book book four, Thumos, the part of us that gets angry, uh, is is something that we need within us. So we've got you know the Stoics and the Platonists and Aristotelians, and by the way, the Epicureans too, uh, distinguish between a kind of natural anger which we we should feel. Uh, and act on, and then unnatural anger, which is being driven by um, vain or empty uh, opinions, cano, uh, uh, doxai, right? And um, so the Stoics are kind of at an extreme. Uh, there's others that are at that extreme as well. Some Christian authors later on, like John Cassian, for example, uh, who's, who's quite influenced by the Stoics, by the way. Um, so the question is, you know, anger is it is it okay or not and even the groups that say yes are like you got to be really 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 careful with anger and don't mix it up with courage because it's not the same thing aristotle actually um in his his uh, nicomachean ethics uh book three discussion of courage where he talks about things that are kind of like courage, but not really courage, he explicitly talks about thumos. Um, and interestingly, it's the thumos of a mother animal who is trying to defend her young. He says that's not the same thing as courage, but we could think about um, that as well. So courage and anger, there may be some overlaps depending on whose virtue ethics you are looking at. For the Stoics, they're pretty opposed. And, and Cicero follows the Stoics on this. Cicero also thinks that anger um, can't be recuperated, can't be, can't be given a, a good function, right? But, you know, that's something where we might differ. I, I would also mention that, like, uh, rational emotive behavior therapy, which much more than cognitive behavior therapy is explicitly connected to Stoicism. Albert Ellis read Epictetus. Uh, rational emotive behavior therapy recognizes a um, proper, limited, rational use of anger or response of anger, right? Um, so maybe the Stoics are wrong on this. This is something that's kind of uh, an open question among modern Stoics. Where, where the ancient Stoics were is very clear, though. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, we got about another nine minutes. Any other questions about courage or stoicism? I, I did skip over. Somebody had asked a question. Here it is. Colin, can we get a video on cynicism? You've already got videos on cynicism. Use Google, right? I, I have done videos on cynicism. Um, the very first thing that you should be doing instead of asking me is using your search engine, and uh, you'll find uh, quite a few. So, all right, any other, uh, uh, oh, here we go, uh, sen quidem. I think of anger as something actually being helpful by being always there as something to be careful about and even supporting virtues by requiring perseverance and courage and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you, if, you, if anger is going to be helpful, it's going to be in very restricted ways. It's going to have to be trained. You're going to have to know what you're doing with it. It's not raw material that you could use. Um, I don't think like, you know, anger is a reminder to not slip and being virtuous. I mean, if, if it's anger directed at your own screwing up, which John Cassian talks about as the only legitimate use of anger. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe so, but that's not the way most people use anger. The anger is very seductive. It's very easy to, um, slip into the idea. And, and the Stoics and Aristotle, I love what they, they have to contribute when we bring them together on this. Anger is seductive. It makes us think that just this once, our getting angry and our use of anger it's not going to get out of control and it's it's going to it's going to work and you know and that's part of what, you know, Seneca talks about this in his book on anger, right? Anger has all these little things that it uses. you got to act right now, right? We can't wait uh, because, you know, we're going to lose the opportunity. And Seneca says, see, this is how anger messes you up. So, yeah. Um, quantum, non-unhinged anger is more like a tool which gives you the energy to change undesirable circumstances. So many people go wrong by thinking that. 
because they think that their anger is not unhinged anger when it is unhinged anger. You should always be suspicious of your own anger. Repressing anger is super unhealthy in my opinion. Nobody's talking about repressing uh, your anger. You, you actually allow yourself, if you're a stoic, you actually do feel your emotions. You don't repress your emotions. Nobody said that. What you do is you don't act on your emotions, which is not the same thing as repressing your emotions. And then you start looking at things and you're like, how did I get so screwed up that this thing over here made me angry? So um, Mark says, I'm, I'm taking it that the next session will be on temperance. Yeah, we're going to wrap up. Uh, so, you know, uh, session five will be on the virtue of temperance, the other uh, uh, one of the four cardinal virtues. And uh, then we're going to see where we're going to go after that. I mean, there's so many other basic Stoic ideas that people um, could use, you know, going back to the Stoic texts and seeing what they actually have to say, like, you know, what, what is this stuff about the indifference, you know, at preferred and rejected? What, what the hell is that, right? And you notice that's important for, for from a Stoic perspective, for um having courage. It's knowledge in part about what's what's really good and what's bad and what just appears so and, you know, is relatively good and relatively bad. So, you know, we'll talk about things like that. But yeah, definitely next time is going to be temperance. Um, Mark says there's a difference between your temper as a faculty and the habit of how that temper functions, so to speak, losing your temper. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, this is a good thing to close on. We are complicated things, you know. Um, a lot of people want to have oversimplistic, what we could call anthropologies and psychologies. That is, uh, philosophical understandings of, you know, what human nature is and how, how our minds work, right? And we are just a, a complicated, hot mess. By the time that we come to start taking an interest in something like Stoicism, we're already screwed up in all sorts of ways that are going to take years and years and years to, you know, sort of figure out and unravel. And it's sometimes kind of discouraging because, and this is where like perseverance could be important, right? Because it's like the proverbial peeling an onion. You're like, oh, I'm dealing with this, this issue that I've got. And you peel it away and you're like, damn it, there's another one underneath here. Well, maybe if I peel this one, oh, oh darn it, there's another one, right? Very often, um, you know, we should we should think of the stoic path not as like we're going to like make a nice steady ascent to become stoic sages, but more like, you know, ups and downs. And um, it's possible to make progress over time, even if it if it is ups and downs. I mean, I can tell you and it's not just from stoicism. Again, Aristotelianism has played a role. Platonism. Um, I'm a much happier uh, person with a much better control over my temper now than I was five years ago, let alone 10 years ago and all of that. Um, Mark says, calling me out here, Greg. Well, I mean, this is a shoe fit wears it kind of thing, right? We're all kind of in process. And this is why life hacks are not going to get you what you want, you know, when it comes to stoicism or just memorizing quotes. Stoicism is a complex, coherent set of ideas that you have to put into practice and you learn on the way of doing so. And it's often helpful to do so um, not only, you know, with other people who can like be accountability buddies and call you on stuff, um, but also maybe with, with, you know, coaches or mentors, which you got to be careful of because some of them are frauds, right? Um, Sen Quidim, learning to be a stoic is unlearning years of how not to be one. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. There, that's 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 really good. There's um, not just the learning, right, and and forming habits. It's also figuring out how we're screwed up, how we're vicious, and bit by bit unraveling that, right? Um, Quantum, just trying to add. I get your answer. Maybe my lacking vocabulary caused. A misunderstanding. I was more aiming at what Freud said about symptoms, that every symptom has a function. Why do you assume Freud's got it right? I mean, maybe Freud is actually wrong about that. A lot of people would would say that. Um, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's kind of a canard that, that we see a lot, that stoicism involves repressing emotions. And this is a good place to end. You know, the broicism stuff is about that. 
don't give in to pain, man. You know, uh, no, you, you, you know, feel your pain and figure out what's going on with that. You know, um, all right. So this is a good place to end. It's almost at the top of the hour. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to get some lunch and then my wife and I are going to a matinee performance, a little, little treat during the day. So glad all of you could, uh, join me for this. And uh, we'll, we'll do another one in about two weeks on temperance, as Mark was asking about. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll keep on rolling with these. Uh, they probably are going to continue to be on YouTube Live, but I have been exploring a, a really cool platform called Lighthall that I did a workshop on um, last week. And I might switch these over to that because that's got a lot more um, capabilities to, like, you know, provide... Um, quizzes and or polls and um, documents and stuff like that. So anyway, we'll, we'll see. It, it, Mark gave you my uh, reason I owe calendar. If you, if you look at my stuff on like Facebook or Twitter, I'm always telling you in advance when this stuff is going to happen. So, all right, I'll see all of you and uh, have a great rest of the day wherever you happen to be.